So here's our home, the Earth. It's full of resources that we and other creatures use. And every year the sun pours energy into the Earth, which powers almost everything that happens here, growing wood and food and breaking down waste and making soil, even very, very slowly making fossil fuels. So every year humans use a certain amount of resources and we produce a certain amount of waste, a bit like taking water out of a jug. And every year the sun replenishes the earth, or fills the jug up again, over and over. But now scientists, and I guess anyone who takes a good look around, are telling us that we're taking more each year than the sun is able to replenish. We're spending more than we're earning. And just like in a bank, we can do that because the earth had a big reserve before we started. Our bank balance was really good. But if we keep overspending the Earth's resources every year, then our reserves will eventually run low and eventually, of course, we're going to be bankrupt. Just like if we spend more money than we earn, the bank balance will run out eventually. On the Earth, we can see that overspending in things like our high use of fossil fuels, much faster than they're replaced, in pollution and salination, in, in vigorous arguments about the Murray River, erosion, climate change and the extinction of species as we use up their habitat. And every year, the deficit gets bigger. Nobody knows exactly how big our reserves are, so we're not exactly sure how long we can go on like this. But we can work out roughly how much bigger our spending is than our income through the sun's energy. Of course, it's different for different people. The good news is that just over two-thirds of the world's people are living sustainably, their expenses are lower than the income from the sun. The bad news is that about 5% of the world, including most Australians and Americans, are spending about four times more than the Earth can replenish. If everyone lives like that, if all humans were spending more than four times the Earth's income, we'd be in big trouble. And because we're spending so much, lots of the two-thirds of people that I mentioned aren't actually getting enough to live well on at all, Lots of people are going hungry and lack proper shelter and clean water. Which might be okay if God cared more about some people than others, or if some people were more important than others. We'll come back to that later. And it gets worse. Of course, it isn't just humans who live here and need to eat and build shelter and breathe and have clean air and drink water. Unless we set aside some of the planet's income for other animals, they'll continue to go extinct. In Genesis 1.30, God gives all the green plants for food to every beast of the earth and every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. How big a circle do you think we should be leaving for the other critters? The more we leave, the bigger the earth's expenses over income gets. If we left, for example, half of the earth's resources for all of the other creatures on the planet, then the average Aussie is spending eight times faster than the earth can be replenished. Many Australians aren't sharing dominion of the planet very equally, and remembering that God thinks everyone is equally important. We aren't doing a good job of looking after God's creation. We're not loving our neighbour as ourself, either future generations who will need resources, or other animals who live alongside us now. We seem more like a greedy teenager, a prodigal son, than a responsible member of the family of life on Earth. We'll come back to all of that again next week. Mathis Wackenungle has said that there are roughly two hectares of land available to each human on Earth to live, to produce all our shelter, our food, our clothing, our technology, and to deal with our waste. We could think of them as being like the two glasses here. And each year the sun will provide the energy to replenish those two hectares. But the average Aussie is using eight. And if we leave half the productivity of the planet for the rest of God's creatures, we need to work out how to live on one. Which leads Mathis to ask, how can we all have great lives on less than one hectare per person? Of course, he's making some assumptions, and we can ignore or modify his question depending on whether we agree with him. 
First, we only need to work out how to live on one hectare, if the information's correct in the first place. But of course there's thousands and probably millions of different studies and measurements, and just looking around ourselves and watching the news shows that there is a huge and growing gap between the rich and poor in terms of resources we're able to use. We know that we're using massive amounts of fossil fuels, which takes millions of years to replenish. We know that our rivers and our soils and our air and our forests are becoming depleted and polluted even in Australia. So maybe he's a little bit off, maybe it's one and a bit hectares or not quite one hectare, but it's clear that as humans we're using, on average, a lot more than the earth is able to replenish. What of these other assumptions? Do future generations matter? Well, if we don't care about them, then we can keep spending the inheritance for a bit longer, probably. If we decide that other animals don't matter, then we go back to having two hectares each. Do we accept the idea that all humans matter equally? Otherwise, we can keep using eight hectares while others get less than one. It's assuming that genocide, or doing some kind of drastic action, is wrong, because of course eight hectares each is sustainable if the population rapidly decreased to about a billion people. So now we're at the faith response. Remembering Genesis 1 with its talk of the image of God and dominion, of being fruitful and multiplying, of plants being provided for the animals. What do we make of these assumptions? As I said, we'll come back to them next week as well when we look at different Christian understandings of what it means to be human. So your first question for today is around those assumptions. Do we all need to have great lives, both all the people now and future generations and other animals? What do you make of those assumptions and so how many hectares do you end up with being happy to use to sustain your life? The second question is around what a great life is. What can we recall about what Jesus said about a great life or a good life? life itself? What can we contribute as Christians when the rest of humanity talks about how we can lead a great life? And finally, if you've accepted any of the assumptions, you might be encountering a bit of despair at the gap between how many hectares it takes to sustain your life at the moment and how many it needs to be reduced to. Where's some hope? Where are the visions of hope for the earth? This earth on which, perhaps, dominion is shared equally and wisely, with plenty of green plants left over for all the other creatures which draw breath upon the earth. Well, there's the questions. I hope they'll provoke thought and debate. I hope they'll go some way to helping us forge deeper connections between ecology and faith as we live on this earth which God gazes down on in wonder as it floats through the great cosmic field.